Uh, morning all. Hello, everybody. Um, lovely to see those of you I can see on the little tiles. Um, uh, we are, I think, yeah, we're going to kick off now. We've got um, a, a good number of people joining. Um, and uh, yes, a very, very warm welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Gidney. Mike, I'm the uh, Chief Exec of the Fair Trade Foundation in the UK. Um, and welcome to our big Fair Trade get together this morning. It's always it's always inspiring and fun to get together as campaigners, and particularly at this time of year with Fair Trade Fortnight. Um, just before we begin, um, a couple of housekeeping things. So you'll have seen that this session is being recorded. It's obviously important that everyone's aware of that, um, and we are going to share the recording afterwards for those who couldn't join today. Um, you're all of you automatically muted, so don't worry about noises off. Um, but you can uh, put questions in the chat. So please, if you haven't already, do do put some questions in because it will be really important to hear what you think um, and what you want to you know what you want to say. Um, there are no presentations today, nothing formal. I'm hoping we can make this big fair trade get together a rich discussion, a really informal discussion between all of us. I'll start by introducing our guests and live, give a little uh, context, and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. We already had some already, so I'll start with those. But as I say, do put anything you want to ask in the chat on the screen. So let's get cracking. Um, this Fair Trade Fortnight, um, as all of you will uh, know, I'm sure, we're highlighting the urgent threat to the future of British staple foods that are produced overseas. So products like coffee, tea, bananas, cocoa. Um, in this first week of Fair Trade Fortnight, we've had a pop-up shop in London called the Endangered Isle. And what we've been doing there is, is, is showing how our shops could look in future if our staple foods start to disappear because of the climate crisis. Uh, we've also published new research this week, which shows just how exposed the food in the UK is to the climate crisis. Uh, I mean, like just as a couple of examples to kick us off, almost half of British bananas and almost a quarter of our coffee comes from countries that are highly vulnerable to the climate crisis, countries where, where the exposure to the consequences of extreme heat, um, the wrong amount of water, the wrong pre precipitation at the wrong time, the diseases that, are, that come with higher temperatures are starting to make farming so much harder. And in fact, um, cocoa farmers in Ghana in, in, the last, in their last harvest last autumn told us that they're beginning to doubt that there is a future in cocoa farming because it's just so difficult to grow now because of the climate crisis. So this is a serious problem. We all know, of course, that, that extreme weather is, is, is incoming increasingly frequent. You know, for all of us, uh, you'll remember the the, you know, the terrible floods in Pakistan, where so much of the country was underwater um, last year. Um, there's been more flooding in India, along with extreme temperatures and water scarcity over the last couple of years. And of course, when when roads and, and farms are destroyed, then agricultural commodities, you know, and communities, sorry, agricultural communities, they you know, they lose their harvest, they lose their ability to generate an income. So the climate crisis has an immediate economic as well as humanitarian uh, uh, impact. And of course, we've all of us seen that much closer to home in the last couple of weeks, um, with salad being rationalized, rationed um, in uh, UK supermarkets uh, for the first time in, in years. And that's obviously because of poor weather in the Mediterranean. So the link between income, farming, the climate crisis, and how we start to build a better and more sustainable world through all of these challenges is what we're talking about this morning. Um, and actually, what has been really good in this first week of Fair Trade Fortnight is to see just how much support there's been for this campaign focusing on these issues. There are 600 events all across the country. Um, the Fair Trade campaign is doing what they do most brilliantly. Um, alongside the uh, the talks and the and the stalls, there have also been um, I mean all kinds of wonderful things. So fun runs dressed in banana suits, um, civic buildings lit up in Fair Trade colours, lots of schools engaged, lots of assemblies, crafting projects, all kinds of things. And as we head to our 30th birthday, next year it'll be the 30th birthday of the fair trade mark i think it's just so wonderful to see the fair trade movement uh, so engaged with so much energy and of course this movement belongs to all of us 
doesn't it? Whether you're involved in fair trade through your school, through your place of work, through your your faith group, um, your town, or even your country. Yeah, I was in uh, Scotland last week to help Fair Trade Scotland celebrate their 10th anniversary of Scotland being a fair trade nation. Just a stunning milestone. So this movement is so rich and so wonderful. And of course, it's global. And as you'll know, there are 2 million producers, farmers and workers, um, and, and they reach between them probably 12 million people whose lives are touched by fair trade in 75 countries. And today, it is just wonderful to be uh, able to be joined by two farmers who are themselves part of this movement. Um, they are actually in the West Country at the moment. Um, and they're both from Rwanda, from Gakenke in northern Rwanda, and their cooperative is called Twangeri Kawa Koko, Women's Fair Trade Organic Coffee Cooperative. Um, and they're here with us now, and I'd just like to introduce them and say a very warm welcome to Therese Nirang Wambije, who is the founder and president of the cooperative, and also Vincent Nsenginyumva, who is the managing director. Um, yes. They've come to the UK as part of a long standing partnership with fair trade campaigners in the Southwest. And a particular thank you to Sue Errington for your help in facilitating the visit. So, Therese and Vincent, would you like to introduce yourselves and say hello? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to be in a Divon. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in this meeting, saying about the fair trade. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm called Therese. Uh, I'm married and uh, I have four children. So uh, I have one, uh, one girl and uh, three boys. Uh, and uh, I'm a coffee farmer, especially expert one. So I'm a female reading a coffee cooperative, uh, but mainly women and men. Dushing a cooperative, quite a different thing. Dushobere gukora ubwiza bw'umusaruro wacu kugira umusaruro mu bwinshi no mu bwiza buryo tugeze ku isoko muzamahanga So uh, the idea was to have the coffee production uh, quantitatively and qualitatively as well as to export on international market Niyo mpamvu rero mubona twahise tujya muri fair trade kugira ngo twizamure tuzamura nabandi bari muri zone dukoreramo so that's why you you have seen that we are now joined the fair trade we are now fair trade members it means that we are developing but not only we as cop but also the community we are living within ngabona turutse rero mu gihugu cy'u Rwanda um, so I'm now from Luanda, especially from northern province of Luanda. So I'm very happy to be with you uh, in this uh, crucial meeting. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Therese. You are very, very welcome. And it is so good to have you uh, with us. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, would you also introduce yourself? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you in uh, this uh, special meeting. So I'm Vincent. Uh, I'm managing the director of the cooperative at Konge Rekawa Choko. Uh, and I'm married, as the president is, uh, with one child called the Brian, uh, is uh, one uh, one year, two months, and I have one wife, uh, it's called the Charlotte. So uh, I'm very, very happy to be with uh, a fair trade cop because um, uh, really I'm earning from cop because every month 
they have to give him a salary. So I'm very happy to be, to be with that goal. So what we can add is that uh, being a fair trade, working with a fair trade cop is very, very important. Uh, means that uh, we are getting a fair place. Uh, we are getting also, we are working in a fair place, fair working condition. Uh, but we are also environmental friendly. We are working to protect the environment. So we are very, very pleased to be with uh, fair trade, uh, especially Devon fair trade ones. And uh, we enjoy many things from UK, especially Devon. We visited many places. So uh, hoping that we are still uh, enjoying. So thank you very much. Eh? Oh, it's very good to have you both with us. And yeah, and, uh, yeah it, we, we've clocked the, the map of Devon behind you, so we can tell that you're you're good locals in the west of England. Okay, thank um, you. Vincent, could you just tell us a little bit about the cooperative? How many farmers, uh, a little bit of the history? And I know you have a coffee brand on sale in the UK, don't you, called Jabulani? Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the the Twonge Agricultural Cooperative uh, has uh, uh, 250 members, especially men and women. And uh, it works with 1,200 coffee farmers. So we, we process 800 tons every year of coffee cherries. So hoping that every year we are able to ex export four containers of green beans. So um, as you have seen, Jabilan coffee is one of uh, is one of the roster here in the UK. He used it to get our single coffee, single origin. Then he lost our coffee. So uh, you see, it's very very nice to see our coffee here in uh, in the UK. Uh, especially, it's not a fair trade one, it's also organic. We do fair trade and the organic coffee. So thank you so much. Oh, it's great to see a little bit of product placement as well. Um, that, a good bit of advertising never goes never goes amiss. Um, can I can I ask a question to Therese? Um, could you just describe uh, your first of all, perhaps your farm, Therese, but then also what what led you to become the founder of this cooperative? Sorry. Why, why did why did she decide to set up the cooperative? Uh, and got need to chat me with founder cooperative Thank you very much. Chatting in founder cooperative Hinzi, Ariko Umsaroa, Tutuana Pugitiri, Quiri, Nibot Katiki, Kandi, So she's saying the idea was from we are coffee farmers, and the coffee is the main crop within our area, and we work for increasing the value. Of our coffee. Mm -hmm. Yes, welcome inside. Um, mm. Yes, another one is that. Uh, mm. Yes, uh, other things I can mention is that when people are working together, mm. means the cooperative, mm. a cooperative, a mm. cooperative, means a cooperative. A cooperative mm. is where people sit and work we'll together because they are they have the same idea and the mm. same problem they wanted to solve. Mm. That's why we, we sit and uh, take a common decision of establishing a coffee cooperative to grow and to develop together without anyone behind. Yes, that's why the the idea of setting a cooperative comes from. 
it's uh, it's very inspiring entrepreneurship um it, it, was it difficult Therese, for you to set this up as a woman Yes, uh, the, the inspiration was that when I was young, uh, my parents were, were coffee farmers, mm -hmm. but when I am in school, I have 15 coffee trees. Yeah. So when I joined the school, my coffee trees were, were treated by my parents. Then when I finished, I found that my coffee trees are good. Then that makes me very happy for coffee, mm. so I continue in that way. So I go in that way because I found that because I was uh, paying school fees from coffee and I was helping in the health insurance from coffee by my parents, so I found it's very, very nice to be uh, coffee farmers because we are earning more from coffee. So not only that, I wanted to develop also to play a role in developing my country whereby we got some US dollars in our country from coffee. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's all right. <laughs> that's so impressive um and uh therese you said earlier you are uh, an expert and it's very clear that you you are absolutely that um and it, it can, can can you can you describe try and paint a picture for us of your farm how big is it um how many people work on it what does it look like because obviously we're in the very cold uk at the moment and it would be wonderful to get a sense of what the farm is like uh do you mean a, a cooperative or a farm a farm uh, mm. Mm. Uh, mm. Yes, thank you very much. As I, I was saying, uh -huh. I started with 15 coffee trees <laughs> when I was 12 old, 12 mm. years old. But in 28, uh, yes. Yes, so when I when I was uh, 28 years old, I increased my coffee trees. Now I have I have 1,250 coffee trees. Yes. So every day. I pay 20 casual workers every day. Mm -hmm. So for coffee tree management, hoping that at the end of the season, I will earn more from coffee production, <laughs> coffee <laughs> trees. Mm. That's that's a very impressive farm. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like you are you have really taken it to scale, and you know that's a, a fantastic achievement. Uh, can can I ask you, Vincent? Uh, are you, or to what extent are, is the cooperative starting to feel the effects of climate change in the way you farm or in the weather locally? Yeah, the weather changes in the weather. Oh, yes. Uh, you see, we are locating in a, in the northern province there in Rwanda. We are facing some more changes in the weather because we we have sometimes unpredictable uh, weather conditions whereby we hope this uh, this month will, will be sunny, but it doesn't look like that. So instead of having sun, we have rain. Instead of having rain, we have sun. So 
that may affect our coffee production, uh, but it's not um, really high uh, because we didn't uh, face a high uh, storms, a high rain, whereby you may find some ice, big ices. So we face, but not really high. Yes. Um, and, and can you describe some of the, the measures that you have taken to improve the environment on your farm over the years? Yes. Um, so we, we have many things to do for protecting our environment. So um, we face sometimes high temperature. Yes, why not? Uh, high temperature, high rainfall, even some storms. Uh, but for us to mitigate, to mitigate those uh, negative effects of climate change, we as cooperative set some uh, uh, mitigation measures whereby, um, because we are on the hills, our coffee plants, are on the hills. So the slope is somehow high, where there is high runoff. When the rain is there, is raining. So we use it to plant some agroforest species within the same plots of coffee. So they are intercloth. So hoping that when the high rain is coming, they will provide what we call a shed that our coffee trees are shaded and our coffee tree are well protected from ices, high ices when we are facing it. So other thing we do is that our coffee plantation are always marched, are matching materials, are matched whereby you may come and sit and take a cup of coffee within the, <laughs> within the, the plantation. Because we know that when the coffee plot is covered, is marched, there is no lano. And the marching materials will become organic manure. So marching and agroforestry, not only that, we do what we call a rainwater harvesting tank. We are collecting rainwater hoping that there is no high lano of the soil. So the water is collected. Other are stored within the coffee plantation because there is a, a matching materials. But not only that, we do what we call radical terraces within the coffee plantations, whereby the slope area will become flat. Then there is no lano. The water is infiltrated within the soil and the fertilizers within the soil, hoping that our coffee trees are going to be uh, to be well and good. Mm -hmm. So uh, other things we do for us to maintain, uh, to hoping that we are environmental friendly, we are doing what we call uh, improving the way of cooking, because we we ride on wood for cooking, but now we have a long-term project whereby we buy uh, cooking stoves called gases, gases. So we provide some gases to our community, especially because we found that they are relying on wood for cooking. So not destroying the environment, please, we have what we call gases. It reduces the reliance of wood for cooking. So other things that uh, for us to maintain the environment, hoping that the corpse is very, very friendly with the environment, we are doing what we call uh, uh, yeah, uh, some organic, um, organic pest, uh, pest management, integrated pest management, whereby some animals called chameleon. Do you know chameleon, please? 
is a small animal which is very friend of coffee farmers. The chameleon is used to prevent pests in our coffee plantation. It goes and pick some pests naturally, hoping that our coffee is very, very organic. So uh, without a delay, I hope that is how we tried to maintain, to work on being environmental friendly, cope with it, mitigate and adapt. So really, thank you very much. That's that's so inspiring to hear. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent. It it sounds like you are creating a a rather wonderful circular economy there, where you you, you talked about mulching, so, yeah. so creating you know much stronger soil health, yeah. rainwater harvesting, um, and the terracing to stop water runoff. Yes. Um, and trying to protect the environment and in which you grow coffee by planting shade trees. They are all fantastic, fantastically important aspects, not just, I think, to help you as farmers, but also to help protect the local ecology and yeah. biodiversity. And I'd never heard that chameleons are uh, helpful on the farm, but that's wonderful to hear. Uh, I know they're very gentle creatures, but I didn't realize that you could use them to keep down pests. That's, that's inspired. Yeah, very nice. Uh, we're having lots of lots of questions um, in the chat, so thank you everybody who's who's put them in. I'm, I'm trying to group them together a little bit. Um, but one question that's come in from a couple of people, uh, and this perhaps is to to both of you, is. Therese was, Therese was talking about, you know, what an inspiring entrepreneur she has become and how, how talented the farmers clearly are in the cooperative. People are asking about whether you could add value in country by roasting your coffee in Rwanda and then exporting it. It would help you make more of a profit locally. Roast the coffee. Ah. And to organise a roasted coffee in Rwanda and sell it to a higher price. Oh, ese hari watubwiye uburyo wifuza ku gukora iterambere ry'ikawa ati uyu ugira ngo itekereze cyo kuzagira ikawa ikaranze kugira ngo yongerere agaciro. Yeah. Murakoze. Yes, thank you very much. Ah, ke itekereze ndagifite nawe twaganiye ejo na kibabwiye. So, uh, I have that uh, that uh, idea, that the vision of the cooperative. Uh, as I shared uh, with the people I was with mm. yesterday, mm. that idea we have is uh, to have a lost head coffee. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, because I, we find that when we roast it, we we are adding, uh, it's like an added value of our coffee, as well as the price will increase. And so mm -hmm. the fair trade premium will be also mm -hmm. increased, hoping that when the fair trade premium is increasing, also mm -hmm. the community we are living in is also, is going to benefit from, mm -hmm. yes. So really, it's our objective. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And and linked to that, would it be possible to sell your coffee locally as well to Rwandan consumers or other consumers in East Africa? Can you sell your coffee, your roasted coffee, locally in Rwanda? <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So, as I said, the mission or the vision of the cooperative is to have an added value of our coffee. So we may sell it locally. 
eh ariko naheza no kuzukumuza mahanga ndetse cyane cyane ndatangirira hano muri UK so but uh, especially on international market because we started to do that mainly we have to export it in the UK mm -hmm. yes thank you very much mm -hmm. Okay, um, more questions coming in. Um, one from uh, Brenda, who is in Hamburg, actually, in Germany, I believe. Um, and she is asking, please, could you explain a little about what organic certification means um, and how it has changed the way you farm? Organic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could go ngo ese certificate kwa dufite certificate ya nike dufashije iki ifashije iki kawa ya certificate certificate organique ngo tushobora kugufasha niki ah idufasha kuri byinshi ariko nabe havinza mu technicien nka manager wa cooperative akabasobanura ku byiburamo yes she is saying so the being a uh, an organic uh, cooperative is very, very important, but uh, allow me to hand over the mic to them <laughs> to explain more about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Being an organic, uh, especially fair trade cooperative, is very, very important because we have to as we as we have seen that we have to be environmental friendly we have to avoid some inorganic uh, pesticide inorganic first fertilizer within our soil that's why uh we have to comply with the organic standards uh because every year or every two years you have to be audited uh, from ECOSAT. ECOSAT is the, um, the organic auditing team. Uh, the office is located in Madagascar. So they are coming to our call every two years to audit, to make an audit seeing if we are complying with the organic standards. So many things have to be looked or keep an eye, seeing really if we are complying with. But first of all, we are not harming the environment because our village, our zone, don't receive any organic fertilizers, any organic pesticides. We do it organically and naturally. So being an organic cooperative helps us when we are selling to organic buyers, we receive what we call organic premium. Yes, we are receiving organic premium, whereby it is returning to help the community we are living in because they put some high inputs for them to grow coffee, to have more production, because they do not apply inorganic and uh, inorganic pesticide. They always rely on organic things. Whereby, for helping them, we, yes, because we are helping them for providing them cows, you know, cows. <laughs> Helping them because they, they have insufficient of organic manure for them to help to see that they are really got a high production. So the cooperative, after selling, we are buying cows, to the community to increase organic manure, hoping that at the end, the coffee production is high quality and quantity, but especially organic carrier. So, um, yes. Yes, so for being compliance, 
or hoping that every month we have to be organically certified, we have what we call in our cooperative certification department. So we have a certification manager with other staffs that he has to work with for us to work as hoping that every, every year we have to comply. If the auditor is coming, please, he's going to see we are ready for being organic, uh, uh, organic and fair trade cooperative. So being an organic and fair trade cooperative is very important because we are not harming the environment. We are not releasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. And we hope the planet is going to be good for all. Thank you. Very, good. very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question um, from uh, Shord, I think. Uh, forgive me if I've mispronounced the name, um, which is, can you just tell us a little bit about how you, how your cooperative has used the fair trade premium? So the premiums you get from fair trade, how have the producers invested? Yeah, let's say uh, fair trade premium. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Yes, so, so from fair trade premium, we do many things. Uh, we provide some cows, coffee seedlings, but uh, I would like to give the Michael to Vincent to clarify more about the benefit of fair trade. So thank you very much. Um, Really, we are very happy to be fair trade certified uh, because uh, from fair trade premium, uh, when we are selling, we got what we call fair trade premium money. So at the end of the season, the General Assembly is sitting and please decide from fair trade premium what are going to be used, what demand is going to be used. So mainly uh, some typical things are going to be used for fair trade premium. First of all, as I've said, we face a problem of having insufficient organic money. So that's why from fair trade premium, we buy some cows to provide to our coffee farmers, whereby when one cow gave birth, the new birth is provided to another coffee farmer, hoping that all of the coffee farmers will got a cow for increasing organic manure, but also milk for them to, <laughs> to drink milk because milk is very important to, uh, to health. So, or for uh, for nutrition. So, other things that we buy what we call rainwater collecting tanks. Those are long-term project for us to hoping that there is no uh, negative effect that will affect our our crops. Uh, not only that, but also uh, I have said cooking system whereby before we, we are relied on wood, but now we are using stoves, but especially gases. So we are helping the community to push from wood to gases, hoping that the, the forests are well protected. So not only that, if you see the video, you will see a beautiful building for the cooperative. So, some money is from fair trade premium for us to finish the new building whereby you have some offices, uh, some meeting rooms, and some toilets inside. 
So really having a start a new building as a cooperative in little areas is very, very amazing. So you've seen that having a such building from fair trade one, so it's very, very crucial, very, very important to have fair trade as the main um, issue as a cop, a coffee cop. So from that, we are earning and we are developing together without uh, really any other behind. Thank you very much. It's really, really inspiring to hear that because the story you are describing is one of resilience. You know, we often talk about how fair trade tries to support farmers to build the resilience of their farms and their communities. And the sorts of measures that you're describing um, help to enable you to manage the challenges of the market, but also manage the challenges of the climate crisis. Um, can I ask you about another challenge, which is COVID, COVID-19, the pandemic? How has that been for your community? COVID, the COVID, yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah, really, she's saying so. Um, uh, in COVID, uh, because we we use it to earn from fair trade uh, premium, we the, the coffee farmers and the community uh, they are paying school fees, they are paying health insurances, mm -hmm. even. Uh, we do some projects, eggs, we have chickens, mm. uh, we produce some eggs for the children that are not well nourished. Mm. So in the time of COVID, some activities uh, have stopped because maybe uh, the cooperative does not work well as it was uh, at the first because it was not easy to meet and sit together and decide and take a common decision for the members is a, was very difficult and for the coffee farmers also because we do use it to invite coffee farmers at the cop as a, a big group but in that time it doesn't work. So, uh, you see, if I have to put maybe five casual workers within the same plot, it doesn't work, maybe two. So, you see, it takes longer to finish or to manage our coffee plots. Really, uh, the pandemic of COVID has uh, affecting us even for coffee production, mm -hmm. uh, qualitatively or quantitatively, but we tried to uh, to cope with that. Then we we are still uh, pushing from that stage to uh, a good stage now. Yeah, that's it's something that obviously has united us all. Um, you know how we how we are managing and how we have managed through the, the the pandemic but i admire your courage and your uh, in, in, in determination in, in what you're describing i have a, another question from uh, glenda in aberdeen who is, is in scotland um, and she says i notice most of your cooperative are women please could you describe the challenges for women coffee farmers in rwanda Mariko Singo, our Mamma Marimu Cooperative, you want him and go over any behaviors. Ah, one of your Nivia, you know, come with my cahua. Um, because come with a minimum yeshi, no go to give me Murugo, and a true color of the Niki, Fungo Yes, who take Ah, she's saying. 
Really, she's saying uh, women are really in our copper, many. Uh, that's why, for as our cooperative, when we are saying like that, we have seen that women in coffee is very, very good and is very, very interesting because in the past, they are were not there. And we have seen that the coffee plots are not well managed. Why? Really, when the women go through their works, they are working very well, whereby you see everything is okay because, because of women, is their culture. When they are put their force into works, they, they work collectively. So that's why we tried to invite, to attract them, even converse with their husbands, please include women in coffee plantations. So their husbands are really enjoying uh, the benefit of having their wives in the coffee plots or in the coffee management. So um, we have seen that when you help them, you help enjoying the benefit of coffee, you are helping the whole family mm -hmm. because they really enjoying the cooking, they really helping the, in clothes, even while not taking care, care of their no, treatment. No, 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 no. So they have many, many works to do in their household. Mm. So for us, we really help them to come in the coffee plantation because they are going to earn. They are earning from fair trade premium. They are earning some trainings. Some of them, they really not, they are not able to go and they read maybe a meeting. But now they are not, they have no fear of being a reader. They really have to uh, to to wash themselves. They have clothes. They are well dressed. So they are really inspired. They are really very happy to be in uh, co-op cooperatives. So, uh, sorry. Uh, no, no. That uh, I was yeah. just going to ask a, a supplementary question because yeah. I mean, what you're saying is is true. Uh, we see it in a number of places where yeah. uh, once women are given a chance to lead on the farms, they are more productive. Uh, they are more entrepreneurial in some cases. <laughs> And so the communities all benefit. Um, but I wanted to ask about the particular circumstance in Rwanda. I think yeah. people would be interested to, to know about the, the laws that came in after the genocide about land ownership. Because as I understand it, women in many parts of the world are not allowed to own land. Um, but in Rwanda, that changed after the genocide. Is that right? So, uh, the law of women uh, for the law. Uh, 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 the law of women uh, 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 yeah, thank you very much for this question. So uh, before genocide, women is uh, is not included in all uh, some main activities. But now there is a very big change because 
That's why you are seeing me here as a cop leader already. So before I was not able to read, to come in a meeting, and I may, I may go home, and then my husband says, please, where have you gone? But now, I have many days here in the UK, there is no problem about my husband, so now there is a big change, we are very independent, we are invited in a meeting, we are the we are the speaker in a, in a, in a special meetings, but now, without a delay, women now in Rwanda is very very inclusive. Yes, thank you. Well, that's that's fantastic. That's that's a a real story of of triumph and power, isn't it? Um, out of something which was so terrible those years ago. Um, there are lots of questions, I'm afraid, and we only have a little bit of time. So can we just, I want to try and fire a couple of, of questions at you quite quickly, I'm afraid. Um, and if you can answer quite quickly, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, one of them is about, actually from a couple of people, about um, what your coffee is like. So Caroline um, uh, from Chester um, is asking if you can describe the taste of your coffee um to sort of give us a sense of what it would taste like oh, thank you very much our coffee is a very very tasty that's why uh, I, I may i may tell you some um, a little bit a story so our coffee is very qualitative why we have the best hotel there in luanda is called the one and lonely hotel when you go to google mm. you may find the best hotel is located in the northern province in the musanze district mm. especially in the kinigi kinigi sector mm. so along the vilunga one so when you go in that hotel mm. please ask for coffee <laughs> very nice that's why they use it to buy our coffee and receive it to their clients. So think about being chosen by the best hotel in Luanda. So very, very important. That inspires to do as well, hoping our coffee will continue to be qualitative. So in that hotel, we have a coffee garden. It's like uh, showing the journey from farm to cup. Many clients use it to drink coffee, but they don't know where it comes from. So we set a garden of coffee showing the seedling, the cherry, or the journey. When you go to that hotel, you may find how the coffee is deep processed, is planted, is managed, marketed, all of that. So our coffee is very, very qualitative. If you taste, you will feel smooth and mellow, mellow with, with notes of cherry, of cherry, hibiscus, and vanilla. So you, you will taste it. So, the clients are very, very uh, attracted of the, the taste of our coffee. Other things that they, there was a researcher from America. It was in the coffee operation. So he did a research in all over the country. So he do what we call single origin researches. So in July, 2021, our coffee was the best, was the first loaded to coffee operation, single origin. I received many, many delegates from different coffee stations in Rwanda showing how I manage my coffee, showing them to have an organic fair trade coffee 
is all about. I showed them from farm till having my green beans, how the journey is. Because really, they enjoy it. So please, our country is very qualitative. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. That is just, I mean, my, 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 my taste buds are watering even thinking about it. Coffee with, with notes of cherry and hibiscus and vanilla, <laughs> you say. Um, and it would be wonderful one day for all of us to come and see your, your, uh, your, your site and your, your farm and your demonstration plot. Um, uh, I'm really sorry, we are so nearly out of time. I'm going to put one more question in, but thank you everybody who's put oh, questions in. We just don't have time for all of them, I'm afraid. We could go on for, for ages, I'm sure. But this one question is interesting because it's about schools. Um, and I know there are lots of teachers listening to this, um, and uh, we have had such support from students as well. So this is a question, uh, Vincent and Therese, about schools. And it's what role um, or how does how does being part of fair trade help schools locally and help in education? <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, really, we want to fair trade to sound, uh, mainly from nursery to high schools. Uh, why not in on national level? Uh, because um, uh, from Fair Trade Premium, we are helping in school fees. Mainly, the community are paying school fees from Fair Trade Premium. So, at the end of the season, when we are selling from Fair Trade, every child is going to school from Fair Trade Premium. So you see that we are helping the community to participate schools. So other things that um, we, we analyze it because we have uh, the activities within the cooperative are, uh, are for women, sorting, uh, even uh, waving, because we have a women saving group. When they are coming in the, in the cooperative, uh, waving, they are coming with their children, their babies. So when they are sorting, they are sorting at the same time taking care of their baby. So uh, we have a, a long-term project of with them an ECD, uh, ER child, uh, ER, ER child center. So we have found that when they are working at the same time, taking care of their babies, really uh, the result is limited. So we hope to have a such an ECD whereby their, their children are took, uh, uh, are, are took care of. So it's a, a long-term project that the cooperative has to put in place. Maybe uh, uh, we planned it in our action plan this year. So all of that goes with helping them uh, uh, in participating schools. So I hope um, uh, from that, helping them in the future, we are engaged in working with the uh, youth, youth. So youth in the coffee is very important because we found that the coffee farmers in the coffee are old. They are all old. So to manage their coffee plots, for them is very difficult because they are not, their force are limited. So we attract youth in the coffee sectors, whereby we have youth saving groups within our cooperatives. I have three saving groups 
especially for you. Where every month they are coming at co-forcing station, we serve, but we train. We give them the law for inspiring them, attracting them in coffee sector, at the end being a coffee farmer, at the same time a COP member. So you see, we are trying to work hard to develop our community as well as to find the sustainability of our coffee because we earn a crucial uh, important things from that. So that's how we are trying to do for uh, for schools, education. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Um, and it's really important for you to know, uh, Therese and, and Vincent, that yes. uh, you have very many people, very many friends in the UK um, who are solidly behind you in your in your endeavors. And yeah. of course, I know you know because you're you're in the UK at the moment, but there are about a thousand schools in the country who are working their way through being a fair trade school. So there are many, uh, many examples of fair trade um, school students working with fair trade in their classrooms, in their assemblies. It's an incredibly important part of how we together as a movement can sensitize the next generation. Um, and uh, you know, what you're doing there is wonderful. Um, I'm really sorry, I'm a little bit over time, so that's bad sharing on my part. Um, but I just wanted to, we're gonna have to call it to a halt. There are loads more questions, we could go on for a lot longer. Um, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, Therese and to Vincent. Um, I've got such, such a rich picture in my mind of your coffee farms and life in Rwanda and the, the beautiful quality of your coffee but also behind that just a sense of the courage and the integrity um, and the commitment that you as farmers are showing and if we can if we can achieve on a really big scale what you're achieving in Rwanda where we look after our communities through trade and we at the same time look after the planet then we will be able to tackle these terrible external threats of bad pricing, low pricing, and the climate crisis. And the focus of Fair Trade Fortnight this year about the risks um, of not supporting farmers to be able to tackle the climate crisis. Everybody should come and visit your farm and hear what you're doing because you are really showing us, I think all of us, the way and that's a powerful message of hope so thank you so much both of you and i just wanted to put a, 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 a comment from catherine um who put a comment in the chat uh she is a teacher and she said a, a message of thanks next week my geography students learning will be enriched by this information as will our fair trade committee in our meeting on tuesday i'm going to get my students to research the cooperative in rwanda heartfelt thanks I think Catherine speaks for all of us. You've inspired us and taught us things we didn't know. Um, and thank you so much, both of you, Therese and Vincent, for your time this morning. And everybody, thank you for joining. Thank you for taking part. Thank you for your questions. Um, just to finish up, don't forget there are more big fair trade get togethers across Fair Trade Fortnight. And also, if you haven't yet, please sign your local community declaration to encourage politicians to do their bit for the climate for the, uh, the climate justice. Follow us on social media for the latest updates. And don't forget, just encourage people if they haven't ever tried a fair trade product. And if they don't think it's that worth their bother doing so, just remind them how easy it is to make a switch and how all of us together making these small switches, we're changing the world. Thank you all so much. See you soon. Bye.